Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of MEEP members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans. Minnesota Farmers Union, committed to helping develop and strengthen Minnesota rural communities since 1929. On the web at mfu.org. Live from St. Paul, Minnesota, we welcome you to another season of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers who are prepared to answer your questions and discuss important issues affecting citizens of Minnesota. Now, here's your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. Good evening, and welcome to this week's version of Your Legislators. And as it happens, it will be our last program of the year, and so we want to thank you not only for giving us uh, a share of your time this evening, but in all the weeks that have preceded our program this evening, as the legislature has uh, gone about the people's business. Tonight, we have a distinguished panel of guests to help not only unravel the mysteries of St. Paul, as we do each week when we come into your living room, but also to help us unravel everything that the legislature has done. And I want to remind you that this is your program, and so we want you to call in with your questions or send them in to us electronically. The instructions will appear on your screen, and we'll see that they get to our panel as we go through the issues of the day. We begin this evening, as we do each week, by introducing that panel. And so I turn to my immediate left, joining us. Uh, I think we discussed earlier you were with us at the beginning of the year. That's and right. Here at the end of the year to talk a little bit about what's happened. The Majority Leader from District 64A, St. Paul, Representative Aaron Murphy. Representative Murphy, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. I, uh, I've lived in uh, St. Paul uh, since 1988. I came from Wisconsin, and I'm a proud Minnesotan. Uh, my husband and I have two daughters in college. They're at the University of Minnesota. One just graduated, in fact, and I'm in my fourth term in the legislature. All right, very good. Also joining us, uh, I accused you of being a fairly, fairly frequent guest. You corrected me and reminded me that it's been a number of years since you've been with us, and we're delighted to have you back. Senator Katie Sieben, District 54, Newport, Assistant Majority Leader. Senator Sieben, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself, and since you haven't been with us in the last couple of years, give our viewers a little biographical background, too. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. This is my 11th year in the state legislature. I served four years in the House and then switched over to the Senate. Uh, my husband and I live in Cottage Grove, actually, and uh, we have three kids. I had uh, my daughter, uh, Greta, about six weeks ago on, this, on Easter Sunday, the, which also happened to be the day before uh, we went back. We had our Easter recess right at that time, so it was kind of good timing in that regard. <laughs> Happy to be here, though. Well, we're delighted, delighted to have you with us, and we'll, we'll ask your daughter what she thinks of the legislature, but it might be a while before she's got right. an opinion, I suspect. <laughs> All right. Also joining us, regular guest, and was here early in the program, early in the year uh, for our first program from District 48, Eden Prairie, Senator David Hand, Minority Leader. Senator Hand, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself. Well, it's good to be back, and uh, yes, I'm from Eden Prairie I, uh, before coming to the Senate, and this is my 11th year as well, but they've all been in the Senate. Served on the school board in Eden Prairie for eight years and uh, had a long career in the food manufacturing business. Four children. Our youngest is still at home. He's in high school. Uh, but uh, uh, just uh, glad to be here again and hope this uh, goes well. And happy to You're here to make sure that it does go well, so we're looking forward to that. And finally, also, uh, who was with us, uh, you were with us at the beginning of the session as well from District 31A, Crown. I remember because we asked you where Crown was. That's right. Just uh, Representative Kirk Dowd, from the Minority Leader. Representative Dowd, tell our viewers a little bit about you. Sure, sure. I um, uh, am from Crown, uh, and, and usually nobody knows where that is. So um, Our viewers are paying attention, though, because they'll remember. Good, so. good, good. Um, and uh, I am in my second term. Uh, in the Minnesota House and, and currently serve as minority leader. Um, and just so people know a little bit where my district is, it's about uh, 50 miles straight north of, of Minneapolis, uh, communities of St. Francis, Zimmerman, now then Oak Grove, that area. So, All right, we've got a lot of specific questions from viewers, but I think it would, in fairness to our panel, it's been a long session. Maybe you could each take a minute or two and kind of summarize what you think uh, was most significant about what happened here um, uh, comments about specific matters that you think are 
uh, that the viewers would be concerned about, and then we'll dive into the specific uh, details of uh, bills that voters are voters and viewers are concerned about. Um, uh, Representative Murphy, let's start with you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you think is most significant about well, this? Well, uh, you know, I am pleased, really pleased with the work that we did together uh, in the legislature. Uh, we listened carefully to Minnesotans uh, as we came through the election cycle, and they were really clear about what they hoped we would prioritize and also with their frustrations about what had been happening in Minnesota, frustrated with uh, deficit after deficit and uh, borrowing from our schools, et cetera. And we uh, were clear with them that we were going to work to try and bring um, solutions that were real. And I'm happy to say that we followed through with our commitments. Uh, we honestly balanced the budget without gimmicks. Uh, we made a historic investment in education. Uh, all day K is available for every child in Minnesota beginning in 2014, in the fall of 2014. A historic investment in early childhood education, which you know, there's lots of data and support for. Um, and if we're serious about the future of Minnesota and our prosperity, we know and Minnesota has a long legacy of investing in education, and we did that. Uh, we reduced property taxes, um, and we also raised taxes. Um, I'm sure people know that, and we did it fairly the way that we said that we would, um, by raising income taxes on the highest earners, um, closing some corporate loopholes, and, and raising the tobacco tax um, for people who smoke cigarettes. And we think that that was a fair way in a way that Minnesotans suggested they would support. Um, but mostly I'm, I'm pleased with the tone and the tenor of the legislature. I'm glad that we got our work done. We did it on time. We did it with some humility. And I, I, I am hearing great things from the people of Minnesota as I'm starting to talk with them in different parts of the state. Senator Han, your thoughts on the session from the minority perspective? Well, we might have a little bit of difference of opinion, I think. Uh, it, it was a significant session, I think, for the first time in, in many years. We saw uh, the Democrat Party in control of all the levers of government, the House, the Senate, and the governor's office. So uh, they were certainly in a position to enact the legislation that they desired. Uh, we think, uh, I think, that the taxes that we enacted were uh, excessive, not needed to solve the budget problem that we faced. Uh, and we think that uh, the two and a half billion uh, or so of taxes and fees that were increased are going to affect all the citizens of the state. And uh, we think in a negative way. I don't think that anyone would argue that raising taxes helps grow the economy. Uh, but when you look at the spending side, I think that what we really saw was a commitment to fund existing programs, and what we really need to do is focus on reform, focus on uh, making sure that we are spending the money that we take in an effective and efficient way. And I believe that we really had some uh, opportunity to do that, but we missed those opportunities. So I think, to me, it's a session that was a little bit uh, of an overreach and uh, missed opportunities to uh, do better. Representative Dowd, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, obviously I think this session is going to be remembered for, the, for uh, probably the tax increases more than anything. And, and you know, at a time when, when Minnesota's economy is recovering and, and, and has been recovering, I know we, we uh, went from uh, unemployment rate of about 7 percent two years ago to I think it's 5.3 percent today. Um, you know, Minnesotans feel that the economy is getting better, and, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the Democrats have decided to take this in a different direction and, and take money out of the economy uh, to increase taxes uh, or by increasing taxes uh, that I think ultimately is going to be harmful uh, to Minnesota's economy. Um, and, and I always say it's, it, it's, it's interesting to me uh, that the, the budget that Republicans put in place over the last two years um, basically got government out of the way and let Minnesota's economy grow and let Minnesota's economy create jobs. And, and uh, as a result of that, uh, Minnesota's budget saw about a $3 billion surplus, actually a little more than that, in the current biennium, uh, because the state saw extra revenue as a, real as a result of more people working. Um, and I think that's a, that's a solution that really benefits all Minnesotans. And uh, so to take a, a different direction, I think, is, is confusing uh, to some and will be confusing to some. Uh, and I know at the same time, over the last two years, the Democrats talked about compromise and balance, uh, and we didn't see a lot of compromise and balance this session. So uh, I, I personally believe that uh, Minnesota is, is better served when Republicans and Democrats have to come to the table and work together. And uh, we didn't, unfortunately, have a lot of that this session. So uh, that's my, my two cents. Representative Stephen? Uh, well, thank you. I would say that we're accountable, legislators are accountable to the voters. And I think we'll see real, we have seen real tangible results from this legislative session. And at the next election, the voters will uh, reward us, legislators, who got our work done on time, 
uh, balanced the budget and invested in priorities that we all cared about. So for instance, what does this mean for the average Minnesotan on the street? Um, for my neighbors, uh, the folks in my neighborhood who have a lot of young children, they won't have to pay $3,400 to send their uh, kindergartner to all day kindergarten uh, if they have a now three year old. Um, it means for my babysitter that her tuition at the University of Minnesota when she starts there as a freshman this fall will be frozen the following two years because of the significant education, uh, higher education investments we made as part of our budget. Property tax, there'll be significant property tax relief, whether it's through the renter's credit or whether it's through um, property tax relief because cities and towns across Minnesota, for example, will no longer have to pay sales tax on their purchases. So again, to go back to what I said earlier, if you look at the real tangible results for what Minnesotans are going to see from this session, I think uh, they'll be pleased and we'll, we'll see that reflected in the next election. All right, very good. Well, let's dive into some of these specific questions. A viewer from Worthington wants to know, what's going on with the newly enacted Minnesota gift tax? Was there a newly enacted Minnesota gift tax, and does anybody know anything about it? <laughs> anybody know anything about it? Minnesota gift tax. Thanks. All right. Not familiar with that one. Not familiar with it. We'll move on. How about lobbyists and lobbying? We've got a viewer who wants to know uh, <clears throat> how that works with the um, works with the legislative process. This viewer is concerned about how many are there lobbying for any particular entity. This viewer mentions teachers unions, for example, but of course there are other organizations that also hire lobbyists. What role do they play in the process? Uh, let's start with you, uh, Senator. What do you think? Um, well, I, I want to say, you know, for full disclosure, I once was a lobbyist. I lobbied for, I'm, a, I'm a registered nurse and I lobbied for the Minnesota Nurses Association. So. <coughs> Uh, from my perspective, lobbyists bring information um, and expertise to the legislative process. And let's remember that legislators are citizens first. We are part-time legislators, and we're not experts on everything. We're lucky if we have expertise on one or two areas. And we look to each other as legislators. We look to the researchers and analysts who help us. But lobbyists also bring real live information. And information is important in the legislature. Um, and so is integrity. And lobbyists do well if they remain on the side of the truth and work uh, with integrity. Um, and when they don't, I think uh, quickly their <coughs> reputation becomes that of less than trustworthy. So it's a closed, it's a closed, not closed, but there, there aren't a lot of people that are involved in the legislature. Sometimes it looks like there's lots and lots of lobbyists, but it's a pretty small community, um, sometimes like college, sometimes like high school. Um, <laughs> but we know each other and we look to each other and you, you learn that you can trust uh, the information from some, not from all. Uh, but they do play an important role. <coughs> Yeah, I would agree. I think I haven't been a lobbyist for full disclosure, but uh, <laughs> in the years I've been there, I think uh, Representative, or Representative uh, Murphy is correct. Uh, like a lot of other uh, professions, there are some good ones and not so good ones, and you quickly find out who you can trust. And I think in this business, uh, it really is important to know who you can trust and that you have to uh, rely on their, uh, their information and their word. And uh, uh, they do bring <clears throat> valuable information to the process, and we rely on them uh, a great deal because we don't know everything, and uh, so they can be very helpful. Senator Stevens? Let me give a, an example of how lobbyists were helpful this session. So I carried legislation that uh, the Attorney General, Lori Swanson, first brought to my attention, which um, the governor will sign into law, I don't know if he has yet, but it will regulate bullion coin dealers here in Minnesota. And um, this came, the legislation was needed because particularly senior, citizen, senior citizens were being defrauded by some um, bad coin dealers who were selling people uh, coins and then not delivering them or they were not worth nearly what their value was. And so um, certainly I'm not an expert in gold coins or that industry, but the lobbyists who help, um, so we introduced the legislation and there were lobbyists that represented some of the uh, largest coin dealers in Minnesota that gave input throughout the entire legislative process as the bill went from committee to committee. And I think in the end, as a result, um, you know, they were certain they were most of them were opposed to it at the beginning of the process but because they gave us input and talked about the nuances of the legislation we proposed um, by the end uh, we passed it 
uh, in a bipartisan way, overwhelmingly bipartisan. And I think it was largely because of that lobbyist input that we were able to get to that point and get to a, a good uh, end product. I would agree uh, that the lobbyists can be very important. I, I, uh, I know when I came in uh, two years ago, we had a very large freshman class, and I, I think, uh, you know, for a lot of people who come into the legislature, you think that lobbyists are, are, are bad, um, but you, you learn really quickly that you can't know everything about every issue, so you, you, you understand that these people are uh, experts a lot of times in the fields that they're talking to you about. Um, so you do need to kind of rely on them to, uh, to give you information. Uh, but you do have to be careful, too, because uh, lobbyists, uh, and there are lobbyists usually on, on both sides of every issue, but they, uh, they have an agenda as well. And of course, they want to convince you that you should, uh, should side with them. Uh, but I think most legislators understand that. And I think lobbyists really uh, do take seriously that we're in a relationship business. And, and your word uh, is probably the most important thing that you have in, in St. Paul. So uh, I think lobbyists do take that very seriously. So uh, we, don't, we don't have a lot of problems where lobbyists are, are giving misinformation or trying to mislead legislators. They're, they're pretty honest about uh, what, they're, what they're trying to talk to you about. Pretty careful. Yep. We have several questions from viewers who were concerned about uh, the uh, pension bill. The Duluth pension was referenced in one of these questions. Another viewer was concerned about uh, whether or not there should be any, uh, any boost to public sector pensions. Uh, another viewer was suggesting that, um, uh, you know, uh, the private sector doesn't have the benefit of public sector pump pensions. Uh, in general, I'm going to lump these all together. Let's talk a little bit about the legislative action that happened with respect to pensions in this session, and maybe also talk about how Minnesota might be different than other states in terms of how they approach uh, pension. Who wants to take a run at that? I don't, uh, Senator. Well, we'll start I'll, with I'll you. take a shot. At, uh, <laughs> I did not serve on the pension commission, but generally, I think uh, compared to other states, I think it's uh, fair to say that Minnesota doesn't have as severe a problem as many other states do. So that is a good thing. However, that being said, I do think that we do have difficulties and. To me, the, the heart of the difficulty lies in the structure that we have, which is essentially a defined uh, benefit structure which, by which we make a commitment to pay certain amounts of uh, benefits over time, and those benefits get increased over time. And uh, the investment, if you will, doesn't uh, typically support that level of uh, benefit. And so periodically we come back to the legislature and ask the legislature to put more taxpayer dollars into these pensions. And I've seen that happen a number of times in the years that I've been in the legislature, and that's what we did this year in the two pension funds that we did uh, offer additional resources to. And so I think there needs to be reform brought to this process. I think that we need to at some point draw the line and say, People who are in the pensions, we're going to make the commitments or keep the commitments we've made, but we're going to have to transition to something that is more akin to a defined uh, contribution plan, which is more common in the private sector. Otherwise, I just don't know that we can sustain these going forward. And we need to get to, at some point, some political consensus around how to do that. I know there's difficulties in making that transition, but in the years I've been here, we just really haven't come to grips with that. Representative Murphy, your thoughts? So, I, you know, we made a commitment, uh, the state made a commitment to public employees um, in, in the terms and conditions of their work for, for many, many years. And the pension is a part of the remunerate, the pay, right? That's part of their compensation package. Um, and we've made that commitment, and I think we should uphold it. And pension funds, because of up, ups and downs in the economy, um, and because of the shifting uh, and aging population, do. Um, sometimes need our attention, and uh, obviously, you know, because we've made that commitment, we're going to fulfill that uh, that commitment to the people who have worked for the state of Minnesota for a long time. Certainly, there are pensions in the private sector. I know, as a registered nurse, there are lots of nurses that work in Minnesota's hospitals, and they have a pension that they fund along with their employer. So it is not unusual to see that in the in the private sector as well as the public sector. And I think we can have a debate about a defined contribution versus a pension, but I think it's important as policymakers for us to consider the economic security of the people who have worked for the state of Minnesota and their ability to retire and sustain themselves economically once they finish their work with the state of Minnesota. And that's why I think it's important that we pay attention to the pensions. I don't, <clears throat> I don't have a lot to add except just to echo what was said that we, as legislators, constantly need to keep an eye on the. Um, the degree to which the pension plans are fully funded. There's talk about rolling some of the more underfunded plans now into uh, PARA, the Public Employee Retirement uh, Association Fund, uh, which is doing fairly well in terms of its uh, overall funding. So 
I agree with Senator Hand that we need to um, continue to have discussions about how we um, fund these obligations into the future and look for reforms um, that will make them uh, more sustainable in the long term. Yeah, I, I think I, you know, pretty much agree with what everybody said. I think we need to kind of keep an eye on, on these pension plans and just make sure that uh, that we're being good stewards of, of the tax dollars, and, and uh, we do need to also at the same time uh, uphold the uh, the obligation that we made to these employees. But uh, but we need to do that responsibly. So. We have a viewer who wants to talk about the uh, heritage law and the status of the amendment to it, and I believe there was some discussion about uh, uh, changing the – from one year, uh, from one year to two years, if I'm recalling correctly, um, and um, the um, uh, commission work of the commission, um, I think Phyllis Kahn had mm -hmm. uh, sort of led the charge on that. Uh, what happened on that particular uh, proposed change? Does anybody know? Well, I think uh, the viewer is referencing the legacy bill, right. and mm -hmm. specifically today, uh, Governor Dayton line item vetoed two funding provisions that were included in the uh, in the Lassard Sam's Outdoor Heritage Council portion of the legacy bill. So the Lassard Sam's Council made their recommendations and um, <clears throat> those recommendations were included in the Senate bill. Um, not all of them were included in the House bill. And so the compromise that was reached uh, with Governor Dayton and legislative leaders was to adopt the uh, Lassard Sam's recommendations and then also um, include two projects that were not included in the Lassard Sam's recommendations. And those are the two projects the governor line item vetoed today. So it was one, one was related to um, habitat for metropolitan parks and one was related for statewide for aquatic invasive species for checking boats and things like that. And I read the governor's veto letter, and it sounded like he was conflicted over whether or not to um, remove this funding, but ultimately decided to because they were um, not included in Lassard Sam's recommendations. Any other thoughts on that? Uh, and I, and I, do, there was some, was legislative action required to change the way the Lassard Sam's uh, commission's work is, was going to be done? That, that did not pass, I gather. Am I right about that? It did not pass. All right. So I think the, the so it remains the same as it has been in the past. That's correct. <clears throat> I think that answers our viewers' <clears throat> question. All right, let's talk about sin taxes. We've got <laughs> viewers who are concerned about cigarette taxes, alcohol taxes. Uh, we have one viewer who says these are sin taxes, which are taxes on the poor. Others uh, feel that the uh, taxing cigarettes may reduce uh, the rate of consumption. Um, Others don't like it at all. So anyway, well, let's talk. What, what happened with what happened with the sin taxes in this session, well, Representative Doc? Sure, let's start with you. Sure, I can jump in on that one. Um, you know, obviously there was a lot of uh, taxes on the table at the beginning of session. Uh, included in that was the alcohol tax, and of course the cigarette tax. Um, the, al the alcohol tax uh, ended up not making it through the session, uh, which uh, I think is probably interesting mm -hmm. in that. Uh, you know, I recall back to the. Uh, the, the uh, government shut down and, and, uh, a couple of years ago, and it was actually the threat of beer coming off of <laughs> yes, the store so shelves right. that, uh, that I credit with edit, ending the, uh, the state government shutdown. So people take that very seriously, and, and uh, if you start taxing their, uh, their six-pack, they, uh, they get upset. They'll come to the Capitol with, uh, with torches and pitchforks. But, uh, but nonetheless, um, the, cigarette, the cigarette tax uh, you know, did make it through, uh, obviously, uh, you know, and, and unfortunately, I th I, my personal feeling is I think it was unnecessary, but $1.60 a pack, uh, pretty, pretty high spike in, um, in the cigarette tax. And I know that uh, proponents have said that uh, a side benefit of that is that it will uh, reduce the usage, um, which I always think is interesting because when we say uh, with cigarette taxes that that will actually affect behavior and, and we, we, uh, we accept the notion that a cigarette tax will affect behavior, but we don't accept the notion that uh, taxing a business or taxing an individual will affect their behavior. Um, and I think the, that we all know that the real answer is that when we tax uh, businesses and, and job creators in Minnesota and, and make that uh, less competitive for job creators, um, we're, we're not going to see companies coming to Minnesota uh, and bringing jobs here to Minnesota. So uh, all of this, I think, is, is something that was uh, not necessary this session, but, uh, but we did see a, a pretty big spike in the, in the cigarette tax. 
So, yeah, you know, I mentioned that I'm a registered nurse and uh, certainly have taken care of a lot of people with chronic conditions. My first job taking care of people with um, lung conditions and, you know, all sorts of chronic conditions related to behavior in large part. And uh, when I think about the healthcare system of today versus the healthcare system of 50 years ago, it is really a lot about taking care of people with chronic conditions, and that's where our costs are. And I think uh, we need to recognize that. Um, and a tobacco tax um, is a way to raise revenue to pay for some of those costs. And they're related to one another. And the viewer has suggested that the tobacco tax is a regressive tax. And I would say so is the disease, the disease burden related to the use of tobacco. It is also regressive and it impacts low-income people more than, and we see the, the disease, heart disease, lung disease, et cetera, in low-income people in higher rates. Um, and and we're gonna, they're going to you know, rely on and use our health care system and our public programs. So this is a way to fund that. Related to the use of tobacco, it's a user fee for people who choose to smoke. And uh, it does raise some revenue for the, our, um, our, general, our general fund, and that's what we use to pay for our, health, our public health system. And I would say that's a, that's a good argument, and I, I think there's merit to it. But the same argument can be made to raise alcohol taxes, which uh, we didn't do. And so uh, I think if the argument is good on the one, it should be equally, if not more so. Are you interested in raising the alcohol tax? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, just, I'll, just you, I'll just relate to you uh, the concern that Senator Bach uh, related to me about the alcohol tax. He said that in uh, Superior, Wisconsin, which is right across from Duluth, I, which is up near his district, uh, they put on the receipts uh, how much money you save when you buy your beer in Superior versus uh, uh, Duluth, and they actually print that on the bottom of the receipt. And so uh, his point to me was that we shouldn't do that because it would be very detrimental to the businesses in the border cities. And I think he probably has a good point. And I think the same thing is true with the tobacco taxes. You'll see the border communities that have uh, uh, retail stores, their tobacco sales will drop precipitously as people go across the border. And I, I think law enforcement, from what I understand, was not in favor of this tax because they're concerned about black market operations starting up, people going across the border, filling their trunks with cartons of cigarettes, and the tax alone is worth about $16 a carton coming back home. Uh, selling them on the street. Uh, they're just not too interested in trying to police that activity and they're concerned about what that could lead to. So I think that if we're going to use tax policy to control behavior, which I'm not so sure is a great idea, I think going back to the doubts uh, point, uh, we ought to recognize if that's the case, uh, what are we doing with income taxes? What are we doing with business taxes? Do they not also affect behavior? If we're using them to raise revenue uh, and then we also at the same time want people to stop uh, using them, uh, you kind of are, you know, what are we doing trying to get people to stop or trying to get people to do more of it so we get the revenue? My larger issue is uh, we don't really need to raise the kind of revenue that this budget uh, proposes. And uh, so I, I just don't think we, it was necessary for us to do that. Senator Smith? The increase in the tobacco tax, I think, will be most stark or most, um, who will see it the most are teenagers who are um, beginning to smoke um, at rates that I think most people would find alarming. And so I think that this, this increase, um, although it, it does raise some revenue and certainly that is helpful, <clears throat> Um, as Representative Murphy said, for treating uh, the long-term co health consequences that smoking does have, I think we'll see some decrease in smoking rates among young people, and that will be something that will certainly benefit all of Minnesota. Viewer from Brooklyn Park wants to know what happened with not passing the minimum wage increase. This viewer says, uh, "Don't they? Uh, doesn't the legislature realize the ramifications of that decision?" And I think. My, my interpretation of this is that this viewer favored an increase in passing the minimum wage. Who wants to take a run at minimum wage issues? Senator Stevens, should we start with you? Well, I would first say that 70% um, of the people that make the minimum wage are women, and um, certainly a, a number of young people are also impacted. But um, to have a minimum wage that is uh, not even close to what it takes um, to raise a family or to live off of, I think, is problematic. Um, the Senate, in the Senate, we proposed to raise it to 775. Um, the House was at what 950, 950, and ultimately, I think it didn't pass because uh, we couldn't agree to a number that was somewhere in between uh, 775 and 950. Um, so. As we look, though, to the future, I think that it's a commit. We have a commitment as leaders of the DFL 
to work hard to try to come to a, a dollar amount where we can uh, garner the support within both bodies to increase the minimum wage. It certainly is a um, is something we're we're far behind in terms of other states, um, and I think the time to do it is now. Unfortunately, it's one of those things that just didn't get done though this session. Murphy, your I would just add that uh, you know the, I think it is the, the unfinished business of the session. And I think it will continue. That discussion will continue. The, the issue is actually in a conference committee between the House and the Senate right now. Uh, and I, I do think that uh, between the two bodies, we can find a compromise that is workable. The, the Minnesota minimum wage right now is below the federal minimum wage. Uh, I think we're the fourth, fourth lowest in the nation. And we should attend to that. And I think we will early in the next session. Well, I think uh, I'll just offer my own theory about why it didn't get accomplished. We certainly had people in both the House and the Senate that wanted an increase in the minimum wage but couldn't agree on how much of an increase to make. I think you did there did run out of time, but I think it was because there's an extraordinary amount of effort given to the daycare unionization effort that took precedence over that, and I think that you just couldn't do both, and I think there just uh, wasn't enough time to get them both done. So that was my opinion. I don't know if that's exactly true. People other than me might be able to fill in the details on that. But I think to the issue itself, I think it's pretty clear that when you raise minimum wages, the people that are most dramatically hurt are people who are young, starting out, trying to find the first job, may not have all the qualifications of other people, are looking for a way to get into the job market, prove their ability, establish a record. And when you raise minimum wages to a point where uh, they don't have that chance, that's where they get hurt. And uh, when you look across the country when this has happened, and you look at employment rates of people who don't have maybe that high school diploma or people who don't have that high education background or skill set, that's where the people uh, don't have the opportunity to get in the job market. So I don't know that we ought to look at raising those minimum wages to a point where they are really outside of the market. And I think that some of the proposals certainly are going to do that. I, you know, I would agree with uh, with Senator Han. I also think that there's an issue too with the with the metro and rural. Uh, some of the some of the businesses in the metro area probably wouldn't have a problem uh, absorbing that um, uh, minimum wage increase, where rural businesses might be uh, more adversely affected, uh, just because of the uh, nature of the the two different economies. Um, so, and there's also been some statistics that show that uh, increasing uh, minimum wage uh, will actually mean less jobs. Uh, so there's a, a little bit of a double-edged sword. While we want to make sure we're providing a, a wage that uh, people can live on, we don't want to decrease uh, job opportunities at the same time. So and we certainly uh, wouldn't want to pay people in Greater Minnesota less than those working in the metro area. So we would have to, you know, make sure that we're being fair and equitable across the state. You're from Swift County. He's got three questions. They aren't related, but we're going to throw them all out there, and uh, and uh, our panel can take them in whatever order or not order that they want to. Um, the viewer wants, uh, first of all, to congratulate the legislature on increasing state public school aid um, and making local government aid more fair. The viewer thinks the farm equipment repair needs to be exempt from paying tax. Uh, I think there's been some discussion about that. And finally, a somewhat controversial issue early in the session, this viewer um, thinks that the legislature should, uh, in the next session, uh, revisit the question of banning so-called assault weapons and large capacity ammunition magazines. I said they were unrelated. <laughs> they are. Um, so but let's take a run at them. Um, Senator uh, Han, um, wow. your thoughts? Well, uh, first, pass a question around yeah. so you can all pick <laughs> <one>. <laughs> uh, I tried to jot them down. I hope I got them uh, uh, in order, or at least uh, the gist of them. I think uh, the education bill that was passed, certainly some increase in the, the uh, per pupil uh, aid formula in K-12 education. I think most uh, legislators supported that. Uh, I think that uh, some of us felt that uh, we could probably have done a little bit more in some of the other things in the education bill. Uh, at least some of us think are more directive. Uh, some of us believe I'm one of them. Uh, we have local school boards. We ought to be empowering them to make decisions. And the more that we do that by letting, giving them the power and the authority to do that, uh, instead of making decisions for them, that would be better. And I think we could have perhaps put more resources in their hands and given them less direction on how they should spend those resources. So I think overall uh, there is support for, for doing that. Maybe we could have done uh, maybe a little bit more on that score. Um, LGA, I'm not an expert in LGA. The cities I represent don't get it. And the fairness issue, 
I know the argument is that this reduces property taxes. I don't think that's ever been shown to be the case. Uh, as I've been traveling around the state the last few days, I've urged people as they've made that argument to say, well, the next time you go to the uh, truth and taxation hearings uh, and the local uh, uh, councils are going to raise the taxes, remind them that the LJ is supposed to reduce property taxes. And so I would certainly urge people across the state to hold their local officials accountable and they ought to see those property taxes go down. But so far in the history of the state, there's not been any relationship between increasing LGA and lowering property taxes at the local level. Uh, the farm equipment repair, uh, I'm not uh, quite sure. I know there are some issues in the tax uh, bill that had an effect on agriculture. I certainly heard about that uh, today out in uh, greater Minnesota. Uh, farmers in particular were concerned about the impact of those taxes, and my understanding is some of those were not really anticipated in the bill. Uh, they probably do need to be adjusted. I think the, there are some things that are a great concern to the agriculture folks. Assault weapons, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm personally uh, happy that we didn't uh, go down that path in the legislature this year. I think uh, uh, that's a controversial area, but uh, I think that uh, uh, there needs to be, and I think we did end up with a position that was fairly responsible in trying to look at how we can enforce the existing laws more effectively, and I think that's a good place to be. Okay. Senator Stephen? Well, for education, there was very significant education uh, increases that were a result of this legislative session. So we talked already about all-day kindergarten. That certainly cost um, uh, some resources, but also there is a 1.5% per year increase uh, to school districts across the state. There is um, new funding for special education and additional funding uh, for early childhood and also, as we mentioned, for um, Minsky and the University of Minnesota. So. Overall, um, one legislator called this the education session, and I think that uh, the resources that we that were um, were well, we're asking uh, the top two percent of wealthiest Minnesotans to pay more in uh, income taxes. We will see the benefit of those investments uh, for decades to come as young Minnesotans are educated better and uh, enter the workforce and get better jobs as a result. Um, regarding local government aid, there was uh, an increase in local government aid and some tweaking of the actual formula. Um, there's also an increase in county program aid um, and the renter's credit. Uh, um, and as I mentioned earlier, the sales tax exemption for city and county purchases. So property taxes went up over 85 percent in the last decade, and I think um, because of this investment that we'll see, uh, particularly in property taxes, uh, people will be able to anticipate that their property taxes won't go up, certainly not anywhere near that rate that um, has occurred previously. And then regarding the farm equipment repair, I think that it was one of those things that um, in the last crazy hours of session, it, um, the the, um, it just didn't happen quite the way everyone thought that it did in the actual language of the bill. So um, I know that we will certainly work on that, and I anticipate we will correct that uh, early in the next session. Any thoughts on the gun control piece uh, that the Swift County mentioned? I would say that gun control, it's one of those issues, depending on uh, your perspective, depending on uh, your life experience. People have very strong feelings one way or another, and I think that here was a, here's a good example where um, it wasn't necessarily a partisan issue. It was more a rural and metro uh, division in terms of some legislators who wanted to see more action taken um, typically were from the metropolitan area, um, not in all cases. So, um, you know, I'm hopeful that talks will continue. We'll continue to look at the legislation that we did pass this year um, that garnered bipartisan support and see how we can build on it. Representative Bell, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, the, you know, a lot of issues there. I think the, um, and, and I obviously have a, a background in, in county government, so uh, I, tr I follow those issues maybe a little more closely and how uh, some of the decisions we make affect people's property taxes. Um, you know, I'm not sure that uh, I would call anything that was done this session as real uh, property tax reform, and I know I've said numerous times on the, on the House floor uh, that I scratch my head once in a while at how we conduct business in, in St. Paul because I have kind of a problem solving 
resolving mind. And I, I, I think you know if you're gonna if you're gonna actually try to tackle property tax reform, that we should actually identify the problem, figure out what it is that's uh, that's causing property taxes to increase if if they are, um, and then actually put a, a solution in, pa in place that that makes sense. Um, unfortunately, uh, we we don't do that. What we do is we introduce solutions and then try to convince everybody that this is a, a good solution for a problem. Um, and, and that almost always is, is not the case, uh, unfortunately. Um, the, the things that were put in place, uh, unfortunately, are not real uh, property tax reform. They're actually, you could probably call most of them a shift uh, because you have to raise uh, one group of taxes over here uh, to send a check back or a rebate back to another uh, group of taxpayers over there. So um, unfortunately, there's, there's zero real property tax reform uh, in the budget that was passed. And uh, uh, as far as the education piece, I think that the most unfortunate thing of this session uh, is that uh, everybody was very vocal early on in the session that, that the number one priority was to pay back the school shift. And I know uh, House Democrats uh, made that their number one priority. Uh, in fact, they even made it House file number one. Um, and in the waning days of session, uh, they broke that promise to taxpayers and unfortunately uh, will not be paying back the school shift or not putting a plan in place to pay back the school shift. And uh, Republicans did make that a priority over the last couple of years. Um, when we uh, when we took the majority two years ago, the school shift was 1.7 billion dollars. Uh, today, it's uh, it's uh, about 800 million, um, and there's a little over 300 million sitting uh, right now that will go to pay off the shift as a result of uh, the budget that Republicans put in place. And I think by the time uh, this particular uh, biennium is over, uh, Republicans will have paid the shift down to uh, probably about uh, 400 million dollars, something like that. Um, but uh, Democrats did say that it was their number one priority. And Unfortunately, uh, they didn't keep that promise to taxpayers. So we have, a, obviously, a very different perspective on the last couple of years of budgeting. Um, and, uh, you know, we, I, won't belabor the, I won't belabor this, um, but we came into the session with a $650 million budget deficit. Um, that we had to uh, repair down um, down from 4.4 billion just two years ago as a, a result as a result of what the a what the Republicans did so. and and because the economy's gotten stronger which is good news um, in in the the budget that was passed by Republicans the school ship got bigger and we borrowed from future re future revenue using a new tool tobacco appropriation bonds um, something that we've never done before uh, borrowing to balance the the budget borrowing. Uh, for today's operations, and it's uh, just not fiscally prudent. And Minnesotans were really clear about that when we were out campaigning last the last uh, last cycle. They were just tired of what they saw as shifts and gimmicks, and wanted us to balance the budget for real. And we took that seriously, um, and we did uh, keep our commitment on the shift. Uh, and there is a plan in place. There is a plan in place, and it will be paid back um, by the end of the biennium, as we committed to the people of Minnesota. And they will see that that, that will happen. Um, on the issue of guns, because I think this one is important, and I've, I've, you know, talked to a lot of people in the district that I represent, but also people and women in particular in suburban districts who are really concerned on, about this issue. And we came into the legislature shortly after that Newtown shooting. That happened where all those children and their teachers were um, they were killed um, and uh, I think that we have work to do on this issue and unfortunately very early in the session um, the the voices uh, around either side of the issue polarized and polarized in a very entrenched way so we do have a very big state and we have cultural differences in Minnesota about gun ownership and gun safety um, and because of that, and because of the polarization that happened around those two poles of the issue, we didn't ever really get to the, the, the heart of the matter to talk about what are solutions that would actually um, help us make sure that our kids are safe and our communities are safe that aren't necessarily about assault weapon bans or how guns are stored, but, you know, how are we making sure um, our kids are safe in school. How are we making sure people who shouldn't have access to guns aren't getting access to guns? And be because it got so divided so quickly, the issue just got stuck. And I hope that the legislature coming up in this next biennium or this next year has a little more courage to dive into the middle of that issue, to set the polls aside, 
and to see if we can actually come up with a solution that we could all support together that isn't necessarily just about the gun, but is about what is driving that kind of violence in, in our communities um, so that everybody's safe. And I think that's a worthwhile discussion. You're from Northeast Minnesota wants to talk about uh, wants to go back to actually go back to uh, alcohol. What's uh, what's this? What did the what did the legislature do about Sunday uh, liquor sales? And what does the panel think of that? So uh, Sunday liquor sales, uh, Representative Dodd, let's start with you. Well, you know, I, this is an interesting issue that uh, for some reason it always comes up. At least in my in my uh, two two uh, or this is my second term now, I guess, where we've dealt with this. But in the two sessions where we've dealt with this, it's always the most interesting day of session on the floor. And it's, uh, it, it, for some reason, I think it happened uh, this, at the same time in both sessions, the day when uh, the transportation uh, policy bill is up, and then we also uh, somehow end up dealing with the Sunday liquor sales. Um, and, and we end up with all of these crazy amendments that uh, really kind of uh, everybody shooting from the hip and, and uh, with debate that nobody really knows where it's going. But uh, it's an issue that has not been uh, very popular and not garnered a lot of votes in the legislature, uh, at least in the two years that I've been there, to change it. We, we uh, again, it came up as an amendment, and we did not make a change, so there will not be Sunday liquor sales uh, again. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't, I, I think the reason is probably the, the liquor store owners really don't want to change. I think they see it as, uh, you know, increased uh, overhead um, you know, by adding another day of, of uh, wages without really increasing sales, because all they're going to do is spread six days worth of sales over a, th a seventh day. So, um, the, the the store owners themselves really don't want that. Uh, and and uh, personally, I, I don't think I would have ever voted to put it into place. But uh, short of uh, somebody stepping up and kind of asking for it to be changed, I, I also haven't supported changing it either. Any other thoughts on that topic? All right, let's move on. <laughs> uh, uh, we have a viewer who wants to talk about transportation policy and what happened with the transportation uh, with transportation this session. This viewer is also concerned about closing small airports and thinks that maybe money could be saved that way. I think that's more of a federal question, yeah. as I understand it. Yeah. But but let's talk about the transportation issue. What happened in this session? Representative Murphy, let's start with you. Well, we, uh, there are many issues. And we told Minnesotans, and I certainly talked with people in our caucus at the start of the session, that there are many mm -hmm. needs in the state of Minnesota, and we're not going to be able to answer everyone in one session, in one budget. And transportation is clearly one of those. And I think there's, you know, I was out in Morris today and in Wilmer, and the infrastructure of Minnesota, both, you know, our roads, uh, you know, our higher, higher education institutions, et cetera, there's some infrastructure needs. And we didn't address that either with the transportation bill, a comprehensive transportation bill, or with the bonding bill this session, two things that I think we need to continue to pay attention to. Um, transportation policy is challenging. It is one of those uh, funding packages that really needs to be balance greater Minnesota versus urban Minnesota transit, both in greater Minnesota and urban Minnesota. And um, you know, paying attention to roads and bridges, and it's just one of the things that didn't get ripe during the session, and it's something that we're going to need to continue to work on. Representative, you know, I I, I don't know that I have a, a lot necessarily to add. I I you know personally, I'm an advocate for uh, being, I think, the only rural legislator here. I'm an advocate uh, for the roads and bridges uh, funding uh, more than anything. And I know in recent years there's been a, a, a really a, a strong move towards. Uh, putting more of an emphasis on the transit, and I know that does uh, benefit the, the metro area, um, but but frankly, uh, hopefully not at the cost of uh, the roads and bridges in the rural area, because I think we do need to make that a priority that we're f that we're properly funding the, the roads and bridges. That's that's one of the most basic core functions of state government, and uh, we really need to make sure that we're taking care of that uh, all over the state, not just in the metro area. I would agree with Representative Dow to the to the extent that roads and bridges are critically important uh, throughout Minnesota, not just in rural Minnesota, though. A good example, I think, and where we need to get to is the Hastings Bridge is close to being reconstructed, or it's under construction right now, and the new bridge is getting close to being opened. And that bridge was scheduled, the replacement of the Hastings Bridge was scheduled to be in... Uh, I can't remember now, like 28, 20, 2025, it was when my youngest was, who's now entering kindergarten, was going to graduate from high school. So 15 years down the road. And it was only because the legislature um, back in 2007, I believe it was, overrode Governor Pawlenty's veto and increased the gas tax. And that gas tax money went directly um, to help 
build new bridges across Minnesota. It certainly um, occurred be as a result of uh, the tragic bridge collapse, and I think that some of the discussions <coughs> took place really ripened more quickly. Um, but there are infrastructure needs all across Minnesota. Um, and so there's an urgent need, I think, to address this in terms of um, finding a way to get more money into our roads, our highways, and our bridges, but also to look at uh, the transit side and what can we do, um, especially, I think, within the metropolitan area to help um, spur some of the economic development that can result uh, as a result of increased transit opportunities. Well, I think uh, I would agree with Representative Dowd that I think that our primary objective with our transportation policy ought to be to build the infrastructure to allow commerce to travel throughout the state, and that's roads and bridges. I think there has been, unfortunately, in my opinion, an overemphasis on trying to do things like uh, fund uh, uh, light rail. I think there does need to be a, uh, a good transit system, but it should be, in my view, bus transit that does take advantage of the roads and bridges that also serve the uh, non-transit uh, uh, needs as well. Uh, and, and I think that we've kind of gotten off track. I, I saw an article in the Minneapolis paper early in the session that called the Hiawatha Corridor one of the worst bottlenecks in the country. And they were solving the problem of cars trying to cross that street. They were waiting at red lights for 20 minutes. And this was the result of putting a light rail line down that road. And people are avoiding that area like the plague. So I think that when we put these light rail lines in and we spend this ton of money that we do, and a lot of it is coming from the federal government, that money could be, I think, better invested in doing things to facilitate uh, better bus systems. We're going through that now in the Southwest system. We've got a great bus system out there that, frankly, feels a little bit like they're under threat right now, maybe being shut down or changed dramatically as this new light rail comes in, and people are not so sure that that is a good idea. So I think it's a matter of priorities. I think there's common agreement among many people that roads and bridges are a top priority, but sometimes we don't always act that way. I just want to add to that. I think there's equal commitment on our side of the aisle to invest in bus mm -hmm. transportation. Certainly in the East Metro, uh, where I represent, we're struggling and fighting just to get um, increased bus service to serve people from Hastings and Cottage Grove and get them up to work in Minneapolis and St. Paul. So the vision is really to see an integrated network, an integrated system where people can use um, buses if that's the most economical way, or in some cases where there's um, certainly higher density, uh, light rail may be the most uh, economical option. Um, but this is all built on the understanding that, um, as Senator Hand said, that our commerce and our economic development in Minnesota is really largely dependent on our infrastructure. And I think that that's a, a commonality we share, that we, we um, recognize that. Um, and the urgency, I think, though, of which we address it uh, is something we may disagree on. And when it takes, as it did me today, an hour to go 20 miles on 694, um, coming back from western Minnesota, you can quickly see how commerce is clogged and that we're not, you know, we're not um, managing the infrastructure in an integrated way. And that's why I think we should be paying attention to transit because you know, the, the trucks and buses that need to use our freeways and highways are unable to do it when everyone is so car dependent. And when people are able to make a choice between a car or a bus or light rail, it takes some pressure off our highways and freeways and allows commerce to move forward. And that's important for businesses like my husband's small business. He can hardly get to the western metro area anymore in a cost-effective way. Well, I agree with you that there's a lot of congestion, but I wish it were true that light rail would solve it, but I've not seen any evidence of it. And uh, I think it's very, very expensive. And for the amount of money we spend, I think we could do a lot more investment in roads and bridges and in bus transit that I think would be far more effective, far more flexible. And I think if we visit other communities like Washington, D.C. or Colorado or Denver. Which have a high, Colorado, much yeah. higher density of population than we do. And I think that we ought to be area. realistic about this. So. The, other, the other mode of transportation that I'll just give a quick plug to is our heavy rail system. Um, the Hoffman Yard, which is just about six miles south of here, sees 15% um, of the freight rail traffic in the entire country. It's a huge bottleneck for our farmers who are trying to get their crops um, into Chicago and across the country. It's a huge bottleneck for um, the Bach and oil feed fields, which are now uh, using our rail lines to ship um, oil through Minnesota. Um, by rail, and so there needs to be investment uh, when we talk about transit investment also in our heavy rail system. This is um, 
an area that I think uh, the business community is, has been supportive of and is very supportive of, um, and it can see a joint benefit of when you make that investment in those lines to relieve con freight rail or excuse me rail congestion. It also can help um, move <clears throat> commuters along that existing rail track. Got a couple of minutes left. A uh, controversial issue in the last several days of the session came in. The question came in from a viewer in Hoffman who wants to talk about the daycare provider unionization bill. Um, uh, Representative Murphy, I think you were pretty heavily involved in that, if I'm am I recalling correctly. Uh, maybe you have something to say about that. We'll just take a couple of minutes to talk about that. Well, Mike Nelson, uh, Representative Nelson, uh, carried the piece of legislation um, through the House, and it uh, essentially authorizes or gives uh, child care providers and uh, personal care assistants the right to choose whether or not they would like to vote to organize for representation. Mm -hmm. um, it's been somewhat of a misnomer, and there's been a lot of um, rhetoric around forced unionization, um, and that is not the case. It is essentially giving those workers the ability to choose if they'd like to vote, if they'd like for uh, representation, and voting in a democratic society is a pretty strong American value, one that I have supported. I grew up in a union family, um, and I think, uh, you know, two years ago in the budget we saw large cuts to uh, child care assistance program. Um, so, you know, there's a, a substantial waiting list of families looking for help for child care so they can go to work. And we made a cut to that budget and to the providers providing that care. Um, and as a result, I think they said we need to do something. Um, we need to uh, amplify our voices so that we're making sure that this part of the budget is um, amply funded. And one way to do that is to organize. And that's what they're asking to do. And the same is true for the personal care assistants who were also cut in the last budget cycle by the Republicans. So oh, it is yeah, it's the, a simple American value. <laughs> 30 um, seconds. Well, the interesting thing here is uh, if somebody votes no, and these remember these are uh, for the most part moms that, that operate uh, private privately owned cell phone daycares in their own homes, uh, if they vote no that they don't want to join a union, they don't have a choice. Um, and that's not real choice. And unfortunately, this is going to increase the cost of daycare for moms and dads who work outside mm -hmm. the home. And uh, they're already on struggling budgets in most cases. And, and really, uh, this is going to uh, strap them even further, well, let's talk increasing about the cost of daycare. I don't, I don't mean to interrupt, but I think it's important. The first question is, do you want to organize a union? And that's the first vote, and that's the vote for those. Writing a law that classifies no. these people as yes public no. employees when they're yeah. not, they they're not. really egregious. They're they really can. This is talk about overreach. This is the class. And if they and if they vote no, they still will end up this paying their share. Forty it's hours on this event. It's, 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 it's not right. It's not right. All right, yes. time out. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. We're out of time. We're going to settle this with a discussion with the public. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next year at the end of February 2014 for your legislators. Thank you and good night. <laughs> All right. There's much more about your legislators online at pioneer.org. Find out more about the history of the program, who's been a guest, and watch all our past episodes. There's also a photo gallery, informative links, and much more. You can also get involved and stay in touch by following us on Twitter and join the discussion on our Facebook page. Thank you for watching your legislators. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of MEEP members, making Minnesota clean waters, safe communities, quality education, and veterans care happen. We work hard for Minnesotans. Minnesota Farmers Union, committed to helping develop and strengthen Minnesota rural communities since 1929. On the web at mfu.org.